I am a believer that if you know your history and you are a good writer and you can explain yourself thoroughly and thoughtfully, then you're going to be fine on the AP, SAQ, DBQ, LBQ. However, not all of us are able uh, to be strong writers, and we don't always know all the content. So I do find it necessary to purposely explain how you score points on a LEQ, DBQ, or SAQ with my students. So right in front of you, you see the AP History LEQ rubric. It has six points. You get one point for writing a successful thesis, one for a successful contextualization, for evidence, you can get up to two points for not only citing evidence that's relevant, but using it to prove a point. And then for analysis or reasoning, uh, as long as you stay in a focused approach, um, looking at a historical reasoning skill, and also um, kind of go outside the box and write with some complexity, you can get up another two points. So it's a six-point gain. We need to play the game well enough to earn those six points. So in this video, I'd like to go over um, kind of how each of these can be scored. If you want to look at uh, an AP rubric as a game where there are six points available, you want to go get them. I think contextualization is not the easiest point to achieve, but it's within everybody's ability. Contextualization is where you, as the writer, provide a broader historical context that is relevant to the prompt. Most students do their contextualization early in their essay, in about three to five sentences, never shorter than three, I think that once you've gone into six or seven sentences, you might be going more than you need to because you've already achieved the point. Um, I teach my students to do it right off the bat. And I also tell my students to do it in the same body paragraph as their thesis. It doesn't matter. It could be a standalone body paragraph. It could be the body paragraph right after the thesis, just as long as it's setting a broader historical context that's relevant to the topic to the prompt. Um, one thing I like to do in a lot of my professional developments is I do the Star Wars crawl. And you can see here, the Star Wars crawl is where George Lucas in the first movie wanted everybody that's about to see Princess Leia's ship getting attacked and taken over to kind of understand what's going on. Um, it's kind of like a cold call that somebody just gives you a call on the phone. They're like, we want to sell you something. You're like, I don't want to buy it from you. Who are you? Well, contextualization kind of gets everybody warmed up to the topic. And uh, I mean, in the most famous of all these crawls, the New Hope crawl, it's a period of civil war. Rebel spaceships, blah, blah, blah. Evil galactic empire. Um, ultimate weapon. Death star. Restore freedom to the galaxy. You take all of this together and you already know what's going on as you begin to watch the film. So I always use that. I get to play Star Wars at the beginning of my um, PDs. And that is always exciting for me. In APUS, I often like to tell my students, look at contextualization as the day before the prompt. The essay is all about um, the maybe the impact of the Constitutional Convention. So then your contextualization would be the events leading up to uh, the Constitutional Convention. I contend that in AP world, it's a little bit bigger, a little bit broader, a little bit wider. So when you're about to write an essay um, about the fall of Rome, you might infuse how many classical age civilizations fell during the same time, seeing similar challenges, similar problems that they couldn't overcome. Um, yes, it could also be talking about the glory of Rome as Rome is about to fall. Uh, I have a couple examples here. Here is one 
evaluate the extent of similarities between political leadership between 1780 and 1840. This is an AP US one. I think I created it. I forget. I might have borrowed it somewhere. I don't think I've seen it on an AP test. Look how I started off in red before the Articles of Confederation. Well, that's 1780. So before the Articles of Confederation, the Patriots are led by delegates set by their colonies as representatives in a Continental Congress. This group is largely in charge of policies dealing with the colonial relationship with England, such as the Olive Branch Petition and the Declaration of Independence. As war raged, Congress had to institute rules for its army, including appointing generals, paying for soldiers, and finding foreign allies. By the 1780s, the colonies needed more structure, and a general debate over the role of the federal government continued, which leads into the new political leadership of 1780 all the way to 1840. Here's one for AP World. It's in black, sorry, I uh, didn't have it color coded. Uh, before the Middle Ages, so this essay is all about political organization of Western and Eastern Europe during what we consider the Middle Ages. So if that's a prompt, then what's happening right before the prompt? Well, before the Middle Ages in Western and Eastern Europe, the Mediterranean region of Europe thrived during the age of Pax Romana. This stability of Rome led uh, rule led to the acceptance of the spread of Christianity, a thriving trade relationship with Asia, and the continuity of Roman law. With the movement of Roman rule east to Constantinople and the eventual sacking of Roma, two Europes emerged that um, had both similarities and differences. That's a little fluff at the end. Um, but what you see here is a little bit of democracy, desire for independence and self-rule, um, some of the challenges they faced. And over here you see kind of like the glory of Rome um, economically, religiously, and politically. I, I threw these in here purposely to kind of set you up broadly. So what I really think that you need to do with contextualization is say if the prompt is about um, 1963 March on Washington. What was going on in 1954, 55, 56, 57 in America that kind of led us to the March on Washington? Contextualize. Talk about um, the civil rights movement as a movement, but also some of the, the victories it was having and some of the struggles it was having leading to a March on Washington. Hey, all I'm going to tell you is contextualizing is an AP skill that is all over the actual uh, stimulus-based multiple choice questions. So being able to get the big picture, to understand the causation of the day before the prompt is huge. So thesis, um, I could talk probably forever on this. Um, a thesis is a highly nuanced piece of writing. It responds to the prompt with historical defensible claim and establishes a line of reasoning. So it answers the prompt, but also provides a kind of a line of reasoning, also known as why. It is, it cannot just be three words. It, it needs to be complex and thoughtful. So with that being said, number one rule I have is it should be more than one sentence. Should be, absolutely. Now, yes, if you can write a 30 to 36 word um, thesis, yeah, then it could be one sentence. But I think that a lot of us struggle with that. So I tell my students um, to chill out, put a period, write another thought. In fact, I look at a thesis as three topic sentences stapled together at the beginning of the essay. So let's talk about that. The AP reader looks for your thesis early on in your essay, maybe first, maybe right after your contextualization. They also look for it at the end, which means your thesis at the beginning of the end, at the beginning of the essay, could have been kind of weak. 
but then you wrote a banging, awesome essay, which leads you to have a very thoughtful thesis at the end. They must look for the thesis point at the end of the essay as well. So I tell my students to write your thesis twice, but don't write them the same. Just in case one was weak, you, you tried a different approach with the second one. Um, now, I teach my students the two and one. If the essay is asking for similarities, you'll have two thoughtful responses for similarities. You'll give one thoughtful response for differences. That is actually helping you with the complexity point, but that also makes kind of guide your writing. The essay is about similarities, there should be two and one. The essay is about changes, it should have two changes, one continuity, which if you want to look at that mathematically, that should be three sentences. Now, your English teachers at your school might say a thesis should be one sentence. Your AP teachers might tell you that, but I'm going to tell you what AP says. It should be one or a few sentences, dot, dot, dot. Does that make sense? So everybody has different rules, but for the spring test, let's listen to the rules that matter. Well, we're back to this one using the earlier prompt. While some patriots promoted a weak central government during the Revolutionary War and the early years of the Articles of Confederation, some founding fathers promoted a stronger centralized government found in the US, US Constitution. So you kind of see um, a change going on. Um, both the early years of the Republic, uh, 1780 to 1800, the era to extend democratic ideals in the face of economic territorial changes, 1800 and 1848, saw leaders who valued a strong centralized government. So you can see that I use the word while, I use the word both to try to provide uh, focus, um, to show similarities to show differences. And the other one here, it's an AP World one I have. While both Western and Eastern Europe used Christianity as a unifying force between 476 and 1453, Western Europe was politically and culturally fragmented and based around a feudal system, while Eastern Europe was, for the most part, unified into one large empire based around an all-powerful rulers. You're going to want to hit pause on this. But once again, notice I use the word while. I use the word both in there. It sets you up nicely to show similarities and differences, changes and continuities. It really does. You can see I wrote, it says, um, I actually should have counted this before. Oh, that's one sentence. Okay, but notice that's a really long sentence. You didn't need to do it like that. You could have hit a period anywhere you wanted in there. Um, so using these as kind of a guide, I wanted you to maybe feel a little less stressed. Yes, it's a lot of words. It's a lot of thinking. But what I do is I take the thoughts here and I use them as my topic sentences later. In fact, you could start writing your essay after you mapped it out write your topic sentences, write your body paragraphs, and come back and do your thesis. That's all you're really doing is you're taking your thesis out of your topic sentences. They're, they should have a connection. I guess the last thing I have to say about thesis, it is worth one point. That means a strong contextualization with a strong thesis, which could be one large body paragraph. Could be two points. And you know, if you get a two out of six, you should be proud of yourself. You're going to start beating the natural average. Um, I mean, really, I think at the end of the day, if you get a three on an LEQ, pat yourself on the back. It's funny how I, I could talk forever. I think 12 minutes just on thesis and contextualization, but I kind of rush the evidence. And that's where, in my opinion, it's less nuanced. At this point, you set the whole essay in motion. 
and now with evidence you have to cite it and link it to the prompt. To me, that is just flat out knowledge base. And I think that these points are easy on a take home or they're easy in class when you're studying the topic recently, but they are very hard come May. Now, to get one point for evidence, you just need to provide specific examples of evidence relevant to the topic of the prompt, meaning you name drop, you, you name uh, an emperor that's relevant, you name an event that's relevant, a place and you know how it fit that's relevant. You don't necessarily connect it to your argument. Um, really, I think a lot of us are able to do that. To me, it's partial credit. This used to not exist. Now, to get two points, you need to support your argument and use that actual evidence that you're listing. So it's more than just name dropping, writing every person event you've ever heard of. Um, I don't this, know the specific number. I've never graded the LEQ. But I've heard, you know, if you can have four, five bits of evidence that you link to the prompt in your body paragraphs, there you go. You don't need to have, see in my classroom in like a take home, I'm going to expect three thoughtful bits of evidence in each body paragraph. That's a total of nine. I mean, it's open book. It's at home. It's open internet. They should be able to. But come test time in May, there's a less of a threshold. So don't, don't worry. You know what you know. If you've studied for the stimulus space, you know your terminology, you know what you know, go in it. With this, um, the only help I, I like to provide my students here is I like to use the as shown by. So the as shown by is where you are providing evidence to show something. Here's an example. As shown by, to help connect the evidence to the analysis and topic sentences and help earn evidence points on the rubric. Both Alexander Hamilton and Henry Clay believed in a strong central government. That right there is not evidence. That's your assertion in that topic sentence in that body paragraph. This is because uh, the United States was still young and needed to solidify its economic political structure in order to stay united, lest fall apart into separate states or regions. Okay, great. That's analysis. That is still not evidence. This is shown by Secretary of Treasury Alexander Hamilton's assumption bill. Then you explain how the assumption bill is connected to having a strong centralized government. This is also shown by Henry Clay's National Road, dot, dot, dot. And that's where you connect the National Road to strong centralized government. You can't just say Assumption Bill and National Road. You have to make sure you connect it. But I know a lot of students who say, Mr. Dramby, in that first sentence, I have evidence. Strong central government. I'm like, no, that's your assertion. That's what you're trying to prove. That's not evidence proving it. Try your hardest to have two bits of evidence in every body paragraph. I don't know, I'm making that up. But if you have three body paragraphs at six bits of evidence, it's not a bad threshold, I'll tell you that. So our last category is analysis and reasoning. Um, to get one point, you use historical reasoning, comparison, causation, CCOT, to frame or structure an argument that addresses the prompt. To get two points, you demonstrate a complex understanding of the historical development. Uh, first, let's take a look at analysis and reasoning, looking at using historical reasoning skills. Uh, what I like to do is emphasize um, your goal in writing. And that is not only 
to say there are differences, but why there are differences. It's not just enough to say that there are changes, but why are there changes? When you start saying why, then you are analyzing. Why change? Why continuity? Why similarities? Why differences? I can go on and on. So let's take a look at the power of the because. Because after the students write their topic sentence, they should spend about two sentences explaining why. This can help earn the analysis point on the rubric. Both Alexander Hamilton and Henry Clay believe in a strong central government. This is because. You're not just trying to state a similarity, but why the similarity. The power of the because statement. This is because the United States was still young and needed to solidify its economic political structure in order to stay united, less fall apart into separate states or regions. Um, I actually feel that that could use an extra sentence. I think this is just me trying to give an example. Uh, never rush it. And if you can have three body paragraphs with three topic sentences, with three bits of analysis using the because, you're on your way to getting the one point for analysis. Finally, the complexity. What I've heard at the uh, AP reading this past year in both US and world was that the complexity point was very hard, nearly impossible to earn. Some students tried to use synthesis, connecting something that's going on in the essay and the prompt to something that might happen later at a different time or a different place. They often use, this is just like when, I've even taught my students years ago, compare everything to World War II and Hitler because you can find so much there. Um, but a lot of students, when they do that, they're not really making a stronger argument. They're just saying, this is just like Hitler, period. Um, I got to admit, I've kind of taken my students away from synthesis. I will not teach synthesis as a writing tool until April. I don't want any of their essays having it. And maybe in the AP test, they'll have a, a small paragraph that is just synthesis. That's their choice. Um, to be honest, I choose the two-in-one approach. The two-in-one approach is connected to explaining both similarity and differences or explaining both change and continuity or explaining multiple causes or explaining both causes and effect. I like that. That's the two in one. The essay asks for change. You give two changes and then you give one continuity. The essay asks for similarities. You give two body paragraphs on similarities and one full body paragraph on differences. To me, that is the best way to get the complexity point. And to be honest, if I'm missing the mark on this or if the AP readers are just looking for higher quality writing, I still think I'm setting my students up very well for college writing. What you see on the screen right now is a four page graphic organizer and rubric that I give my students as an outline um, that they could fill in uh, for practice in class, out of class, um, just so they practice the format. Now let's go back and look at the original rubric to see where we all started this long, long adventure, and I know it has been quite long. One point for thesis, one point for contextualization, two points for evidence, two points for analysis and reading, reasoning. That is six points on the AP History LEQ rubric. I usually tell my students to do it in a five paragraph essay. It's something they've been doing, I think at my school since eighth grade. Some of the more advanced writers have been doing it since um, seventh grade. So they know what a five paragraph essay is. Why, why tell them to do something different? Um, the funny part is they have such limited time to write. What is it, like 40 minutes? And they've just done the SAQs, the DBQ, and all the stimulus-based multiple choice. 
and it requires straight up knowledge, yeah, it's really going to be hard for kids to get fives and six out of sixes. You know, you could hold your standard high during the school year, but come the AP test, students struggle with the LEQ. I'm not telling anybody that is listening to bag the LEQ. I just want you to not be stressed. Go in there, get a two out of six, maybe get a three out of six. If you get a four or a five out of six, you are probably already doing a five or or six on the DBQ, and you probably did uh, pretty darn well in the stimulus space and, and SAQ. So I think if you're going to do well in the LEQ, you probably did well in the whole test. I mean, I don't have any data to back me up, but I doubt anybody has gotten a five only because of their LEQ essay. It's only 15% of your overall score. All right. Hey, just remember to relax, write clearly, write with a purpose, be fine. Have a good one.